on June 4th, 2019, a heartbreaking phone call was received by the Randolph County Sheriff's Office. We've been trying to find her for the last few days, almost a week, and we've not heard from her. Uh, what is your name, honey? Butch Smith. I'm her son. We came to do a wellness check at her house. I think I found a body. Okay, honey. We'll, we'll get an ambulance out of that way, okay? As you just heard, the caller's name was Butch Smith, the son of Linda Collins. At the time of this phone call, Linda was going through a very transitional period in her life. After 10 years of service, she had just been voted out of her position as Arkansas State Senator, losing her seat in the state capitol. Moving out of my office today, I just want to say how humble I am to be your senator, how proud I was to serve you. That's the way I voted, as your conservative senator and your friend. She had also been going through a messy divorce, but Linda was a resilient person. She was able to refocus her life in just a few months. She returned to her small hometown, Pocahontas, Arkansas, a home to about 7,500 people. There, she was able to focus on her motel businesses, a Days Inn as well as the Rock and Roll Highway 67 Inn. She was also able to spend more time with her grandchildren. Go! Jingle bells, jingle all the way. What? A video year! <laughs> she was described as the fun grandparent. She began dating a new man and was looking into new prospects for lobbying jobs around the U.S. One of those prospects was in D.C., so Linda took a trip there on May 27th. After what seemed to be a successful interview, she talked about it with her daughter Tate through text. This was the final conversation had with Linda before her disappearance. A couple of days later, Tate sent her mother a picture of a new pair of shoes. However, this time around, there was no reaction at all. Tate felt slightly unsettled by this, but her mother had said that she would be busy over the next couple days, so she tried not to assume the worst. That unsettled feeling only grew as each day passed without any response from Linda. Tate lived just outside of Little Rock, another city in Arkansas about two hours away from Pocahontas. At this point, Linda was supposed to be in Little Rock, getting ready to attend the Arkansas Music Awards. So Tate called her brother Butch to do a wellness check. Linda's truck was in the driveway, but she wouldn't answer the door. Peeking around the house and through the windows, nothing seemed to be out of place. Butch did not have his own key to the house, so just to be sure nothing was wrong, they decided to contact their grandfather, Linda's dad, who did have a key and would come back the next day. Their grandfather was a bit more investigative. He tried opening the doors on her truck and noticed that they were unlocked, something highly unusual from Linda, who was compulsive about keeping her vehicles locked at all times. He also tried the back door of the house and found that to be unlocked as well. He proceeded into the home, which was under renovation. He called out her name and checked every room and closet, but to no avail. However, in the kitchen was a large stain that darkened the floor. At a first glance, there were two things that this stain could have been from, coffee or blood. Linda was a heavy coffee drinker, so it was possible that she could have dropped a pot of coffee and not cleaned it up. But why would she not clean it up? Either way, something clearly went wrong here. Butch was called to come help investigate the house as well and he was there within minutes. After spending a bit more time investigating the house, they left out through the front door. As they left, their grandfather smelled something strange coming from the driveway. Beside Linda's truck were construction materials for the house, covered by a tarp. Butch went to take a look underneath the tarp, and upon lifting it up, a swarm of flies bombarded him. The smell was overbearing, like a decomposing dead animal. He looked back and saw his mother lying face down with her arms above her head, wrapped in a blanket. He told his grandfather that he found her and to stay away from the tarp, physically blocking him from moving toward it. That is when Butch called 911. Linda Collins Smith. We got a 911 call from a Butch Smith. The Randolph County Sheriff's Office responded quickly, arriving on the scene with body cams rolling and creating a border of crime scene tape around the house. They were joined by the Arkansas State Police soon after. Have y'all been inside the home? Yes. Yes, we have. We'll wait till my sheriff gets here. Uh, okay. But yeah, we're going to need in there. Okay. So there's going to be something up with this. Uh, we are going to need CID out here. Before the sheriff, Kevin Bell, went inside the house to investigate, he took note of some observations from the outside of the house. In several places all around the house, he noticed mounting brackets on the walls. He had seen these types of mounting brackets before and knew there should have been cameras mounted on them. However, it seemed like somebody had removed them. 
Also, on the walkway leading up to the house, there was part of what appeared to be a plastic hair beret broken off on the ground. Moving into the house, the most jarring piece of evidence was, of course, the large stain on the rough wood subflooring. With a trained eye now looking at it, it was obvious to the sheriff that this was not a coffee stain. Once the Arkansas Mobile Crime Lab arrived on the scene, they were able to take a look at Linda's body and determine that the cause of death was in fact multiple stab wounds. On the kitchen counter next to the stain was a Clorox spray bottle with a smudge of blood on the nozzle, pointing to a cleanup attempt. Other than that, there weren't many clues to help investigators build a timeline of the crime. All they knew was that there was no signs of a forced entry, meaning Linda may have known the person who killed her. They also knew that she was stabbed to death in her kitchen. Her body was wrapped in a blanket to minimize the mess, and then she was dragged out of her house and put under the tarp. The next best thing that investigators could do was build a timeline of the days leading up to Linda's death. They decided to speak to Linda's inner circle of family and friends. Speaking with Butch and Tape, they learned about her job interview in D.C. and her disappearance thereafter. They also spoke to one of her closest friends, Tim Loggins, who was a state corrections officer for 28 years, and his wife, Rebecca O'Donnell, or Becky for short. I love that woman like a sister, and this is killing me. And I know you're upset, and I don't want to upset you anymore. Oh, I know, Miss Becky. I know it's hard. <laughs> she was my best friend. I started out working for her as her personal assistant. Becky started off as Linda's personal assistant, but quickly became more than just co-workers. As Becky drove Linda around and managed her hospitalities, they became good friends as well. Becky told investigators that she had picked up Linda from the airport after her trip to D.C., but was having trouble remembering the details due to misplacing her phone. I'm lost without my phone. <laughs> Bless your heart, I bet you are. I, even, I think I have some screenshots in my texts of her flight okay. details. Tim had a call with Becky and Linda on the drive home from the airport. It was just simple small talk until Linda said that she was too tired to tell him all about the trip and that they would have to catch up tomorrow. The following day, Linda texted Becky to bring lunch to the house. The two ended up arguing about Linda's new boyfriend, Rendell Wallace, who had stayed the night and left that morning. I went out there and she told me all about the night before because the man out there, Rendell, spent the night with her. When I left, she was mad at me. Why was she mad at you? As I was buttoning in her personal life. She was talking about how the night before it had taken Rendell like four hours to, get, to respond to her text and call. This is before he came over, I'm yes. assuming. Okay. And she was kind of upset about it, and I told her she had no right to be upset. I she needed to slow down and take it easy and get to know him. Yeah, well, that would make her my head. I would say, well, my like, Linda does right not now. like. Well, she's a senator. She's right. telling people what to do, not being told and what she to really do. She really is. She really is. You know, she was wondering if he had been with somebody else, and that's why he wasn't responding. And I just told her she was going over the top. You needed to stop. Later on, Becky ended up calling Linda with the hopes of making amends, but the two only ended up arguing yet again. She said something about, well, I may just go over to Rendell's or something like that. And I said, I thought you didn't want me in your personal stuff. Don't tell me. And she hung up on me. After this call, Linda was scheduled for a meeting at her hotel, but she didn't show up. With this information, the next logical person to look into was Rendell. Even Tim backed up Becky's story about Rendell. You know, he was probably the last person to see her. When investigators started asking around about Rendell, they quickly found out that he wasn't exactly a new guy at all. She had told Tim that before her marriage with her ex-husband, Phil Smith, she was actually seeing both men at one point. Eventually, she made her choice to pursue her relationship with Phil, but she went on to regret that decision. Just a couple of weeks before her death, Linda and Rendell reconnected and instantly took to each other. It just picked up and, okay. and we was just happy to be with one another, you know? The detectives learned that Linda loved to dance and that it was a big part of her and Rendell's relationship. They would frequently go on dates that revolved around dancing. We went down to the Eagles and had a few drinks and danced because we loved to dance, me and her both. So we hooked up and we went down there and danced and wound up spending the night in Jonesboro at a motel. Okay. To exemplify her love for dancing even more, it turns out that she had gone to Arizona as well during her D.C. trip purely to meet with her cousins. It was to celebrate her birthday, and the video that you are currently seeing sums up that excursion. During that trip, she had messaged Rendell to come meet her. So I told her, I didn't, you know, I didn't have the money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so she said, well, I'll be in Monday. She said, I want to see you. When Linda had finally arrived home and settled in, 
she messaged Rendell to see if he wanted to come over for the night. She said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I'm laying here on the couch watching TV. And she said, why don't you come over? I said, I'd love to. And we hugged and kissed, and she let me out the door and locked the door behind me. Okay. I went out the patio door. Hold on just a minute. Okay. So she walked you out, walked me out, mm-hmm. the patio door? Yeah. The couple said their farewells, and Rendell proceeded to text Linda several times throughout the week but was met with no response. But I thought, well, she's just in meetings, you know, down in Little Rock, you know, she'll get back to me later on. And then I never heard anything from her since. The detectives were getting mixed stories from Becky and Rendell. Becky said that after their argument, Linda went on to spend more time with Rendell. Rendell said that the last he saw of Linda was kissing her goodbye at the doorstep before her argument with Becky. Was Becky lying about the contents of her phone call with Linda, where she said that she was going to stay with Rendell? Or was Rendell lying about the last time that he saw Linda? Or was it possible that Linda had lied about where she was going and actually stayed at home, then was met with a horrific act of violence by some random intruder? There were many questions that still needed to be answered to get to the bottom of Linda's demise, but Tim erred on the side of caution regarding Rendell. My entire life has taught me that you never ever um, think you know what's going on and, and, and no one is above anything. Rendell's house was up in the hills, in the middle of nowhere, with no cell service. So if Linda had gone up there after her and Becky's argument, it would make sense that nobody could get a hold of her. But Rendell wasn't the only man in Linda's life whose name kept popping up. When the EMTs had first talked about Butch to his grandfather, they had mentioned that Linda was recently divorced to a man named Phil Smith, and that information was then passed on to the police. Well, he said that her and Phil were just recently divorced. Okay. Phil was an attorney and a municipal judge for Pocahontas when he had met Linda. He quickly became a father figure to Butch and Tate, who were in elementary school at the time. As the marriage continued and the couple's careers flourished, they became what people referred to as a power couple. They opened a couple of motels together. Phil was appointed to the bench of a circuit court, and Linda became a state senator. However, behind closed doors, things weren't as smooth as they seemed. After about 10 years of the relationship, it became more of a business arrangement than a marriage. They made it work, but after about 23 years together, and new feelings for her past love interest, Rendell, the couple divorced. The settlement case began, and as they fought for the ownership of their assets, bitterness towards each other grew. Linda had even made the accusation that she had caught Phil watching pornography in his office on his state-provided computer, and she used this accusation to her advantage in the divorce settlement. Phil was then investigated by the Judicial Discipline and Disability Commission, and they determined that he had improperly used court computer equipment after regular work hours at the office. He ultimately met the consequences for this. He was essentially banned from being a judge in Arkansas from that point on. Luckily for Phil, the divorce eventually concluded, and his payout was significantly more than Linda's. She got screwed. Phil got almost everything. Here's the kicker. Linda appealed it. And when the judge says that could be another 17 months, Phil just collapsed. Oh my God, is this never going to end? It's reasonable to believe that this ongoing battle could be a motive to murder Linda. Phil's career and livelihood was in shambles, and another year and a half of divorce proceedings could have pushed him over the edge. There was one more crucial piece of information that the investigators gathered from Linda's friends and family. I'm going to tell you another thing. Linda was scared to death of him. Scared of Phil? Of Phil. Linda was deathly afraid of Phil for whatever reason. Everybody I talked to says she's scared to death of Phil. She is. She felt scared that he was going to do something. Do you think your mom's scared of your dad? Was scared yes. of your dad? Yes. You do? Yes. I you do. really believe there was I a believe. fear there. It wasn't an act. It was a fear I there. I fully believe, firmly, firmly, with all, everything, believe that she was afraid of him. Let me tell you a story. Now, my mom was sick for several, several years, and it was kind of... Everybody knew or knew that she was sick, and nobody could figure out what in the world was wrong with her. In the early 2000s, Linda had gone from her usual energetic, on-top-of-the-world self to lethargic and bedridden a majority of the time. She went to a doctor's and got her blood work done, and it revealed that she had an alarming amount of mercury in her body. There were a number of theories about where this mercury could have come from. If her body wasn't processing mercury properly, it could have come from eating fish, 
But Linda rarely ate fish. It also could have come from her fillings, but the sheer amount of mercury in her bloodstream made that unlikely as well. The doctor said it was almost as if she had drunk a thermometer. With no clear explanation as to what had caused this, Linda was convinced that Phil had poisoned her. She thinks Phil tried to kill her. Um, Linda told me that herself now and said Phil done it. Almost killed her. I just can't believe that they'd let that go, you know? He's a judge. According to Becky, Phil had even darker secrets. What is I keep thinking she's going to get mad at me for telling this stuff. No. <laughs> she wouldn't get mad at you, baby. <laughs> Phil used to hit her. Phil used to hit her. Okay, where Linda's house is. And he was just sitting there. Mm. I think he's a stalker. I saw firsthand when he showed up at his house that day when we were moving stuff out. She was uncontrollably shaking. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. She's scared of you. She's scared of me. She's very scared of me. I called Linda and I had her on the phone. And she was telling me, you're not supposed to be there. You need to leave and all that. Linda told me he could get these crazy eyes. He got these crazy eyes and looked at me and said, you stay out of it. Or something to that effect. So all. you were kind of scared of him too a little bit. Well, Yes. Linda began preparing for the worst when it came to Phil. She changed the locks on her doors and, with the help of Tim and Becky, set up a security system including a plethora of cameras all around the house. Every corner, window, and entrance could be seen from Linda's phone or laptop. What do you suspect then? Uh, her ex-husband killed her. Really? Phil? Yeah. Sheriff Kevin Bell spoke to Phil over the phone, and Phil simply denied the notion that he had killed Linda. With the publicity of the case, he even sent a written statement to NBC News saying that he denied the accusations made against him. He stated, I have not heard that Linda accused me of trying to poison her with mercury. I certainly did not do that. The divorce was unnecessarily bitter, but I was never physically violent or emotional towards Linda. He also said, I never stalked Linda at her home, work, or any other place. While the questioning of Linda's inner circle was certainly helpful, it was mainly resulting in only rumors and accusations without any hard evidence. As the investigation pushed on, two memorials were held for Linda, one in the state capital Little Rock where colleagues and political allies alike could attend and pay their respects, and one at a local church in Pocahontas, specifically for close family and friends. At the one in Little Rock, many of the attendees wore red, Linda's favorite color. Linda was a part of our uh, weekly Bible studies, and uh, we had great interactions uh, with her. And it, it's a privilege and a pleasure to with um, her, her family and friends. I think there. Oh, Father God, um, thank you for the folks that have turned out this morning and showing love you know, for Linda. Linda had a poor set of values that made up who she was. She lived them out and stood firm on, firm on them no matter the cost. She was the same person behind closed doors as she was outside. Um, we were at a taco, and Linda was dressed in her red suit with her red lipstick on. She was animated. She was passionate. Okay. Now I will read a statement prepared by the family and answer a couple of questions the best that I can. The family thing. We want to thank everyone for the outpouring of love and prayer during this very difficult time. We ask for your understanding and being unable to speak about the ongoing investigation involving Linda Pollen. As much as we want to speak to you, know that we also want and need to protect the integrity of this investigation. We are surprised, upset, angered, and saddened by this event, and are at a loss for words in describing the feelings and emotions that we are currently going through. She was always there to listen and to try to help where she could. She would always go above and beyond for people in need. At this time, her family was not taking questions and directly go to the investigating proceedings. 
In the time between the first and second memorial, Tate did some investigating of her own and was able to gain access to her mother's email. Linda's email was linked to her home security system, so anytime movement was captured on the cameras, she would be alerted. Looking through her inbox, Tate discovered that on the day her mom was likely murdered, there were several alerts. She informed the detectives, who were able to gain access to Linda's security system account, in hopes of reviewing the camera footage. However, someone had logged into Linda's account the same day as her murder and deleted any footage from that day. Whoever did this was likely the same person who removed the cameras themselves, anything to cover their tracks. The detectives proceeded to contact the company behind Linda's security system and issued them with subpoenas and search warrants. Two days later, a package arrived at the police department containing a flash drive with all of the footage that was stored in the cloud from Linda's cameras. As the police worked to review this footage, visitors began to arrive at Linda's second memorial in Pocahontas. The detectives were confident that whoever the killer was, they were close to Linda and would likely be at the church unless they acted quickly. Watching the footage, they pieced together a timeline leading to Linda's death, including when Becky showed up at Linda's house for a few minutes to drop off lunch. It has a delay in sending, it's what's happened. Three hours later, a blood-curdling scream could be heard from the camera in front of the garage. Later that night, footage from the same angle captured someone returning to the crime scene, hiding under a white sheet. Continuing through the hours of footage from multiple different cameras, they finally hit the jackpot. It turns out that upon removing the cameras from their mounting brackets, they can still operate using battery power. After being thrown into the bottom of a bag, one of those cameras captured none other than Becky O'Donnell. Both her and the knife she is seen holding, covered in blood. From an outsider's perspective, this may seem like a shocking twist, but Becky was actually on the detective's radar since their first interview with her. I know, Miss Becky. <laughs> I know it's hard. She was my best friend. I started out working for her as her personal assistant. Apparently, during this moment, even though Becky was letting out emotional sobs, no tears were coming out. This wasn't the only red flag that was revolving around Becky. Do you have a home phone? No. Just a sale? Yeah, I lost that today. You lost it? Today? Becky had allowed the investigators to look at her phone records to help build a proper timeline. Her records indicated that she had actually used her phone throughout the time that she said that she had lost it. There were also discrepancies between her statements and Tim's. Tim said that since Linda's disappearance, Becky had been going over to the house nearly every day. Becky's been going by her house about every day, knocking on the door and, you know calling her and texting her and, hey, you know, answer, we're getting worried. Meanwhile, Becky somehow couldn't recall which day she had been back to the house. What day was that that you went back to her house? I don't recall. It seemed as if she didn't want the investigators to know that she was going back to the crime scene frequently. As the investigators learned more about Becky, they found out that this wasn't the only time that Becky had been caught up in somebody's murder plot. In 2007, she had faced accusations of plotting to have her now ex-husband murdered. One of the couple's friends had alerted him that she was offering $50,000 to have somebody kill him. But Becky explained to the police that she was intoxicated and wasn't actually serious about it. It was her word against theirs, so she was never charged for anything. The investigators later expressed their suspicions to Butch and Tate. You know, I talked to Tim and Becky, and, and I gotta tell you something, Butch, um... There's things that ain't adding up there either. I felt like for a while there was something fishy between the two of them. I'd never heard of these people until divorce time, and all of a sudden they were all up there in their business and helping move furniture and do stuff, and I'd never met these people before. None of these strange inconsistencies, nor her past actions, could explain what Becky's motive might have been for killing Linda. The detectives kept probing Butch and Tate, and they learned that in the weeks leading up to Linda's disappearance, they had noticed money coming out of their grandpa's bank account. My grandpa just recently started seeing money coming out of his account that he didn't authorize. My mom wouldn't just take from my grandpa. That's, that's not something that she's ever done. According to Becky, Linda trusted her so much she would allow her to manage any financial business, including signing her name on checks. A lot of times Linda would have me sign off or sign checks or something or mm -hmm. go get her cash or something. But she was on her account where she could sign, you could sign her check. No, she would just have me sign her name. Oh, you were signing her name? Yeah, she oh, would. Oh, Becky, that was not a smart thing to do. <laughs> According to the detectives, however, Becky had been stealing from Linda for many months, from not only her father, but also from her motel business. They believed that because Linda was traveling so much, she hadn't noticed any suspicious activity in her finances. But once she came home from D.C. and Tate informed her of the checks, Linda confronted Becky, leading to a fatal argument. The investigators needed to move swiftly if they wanted to intercept Becky before she arrived at the memorial. 
As they approached closer and closer to the church, the lead state investigator finally gave them the green light. The police pulled them over and arrested Becky right outside the memorial service. She was then brought down to the police station for questioning. Hi, Becky. Hey. Sit right here. I'm going to lay it all out there for you, okay? You're under the risk of the murder, Linda. You understand that? We got you. We got you. We got video of you. You didn't erase them all. We got you. Becky requested a lawyer immediately, so the questioning didn't last long. Tim showed support for Becky while she was in jail by calling her consistently. I love you. I love you. I believe in you. You got a lot of people. Well, I know that, honey. Baby, they're that good. They're that powerful. The stuff they have made up on me right now. If I was on the outside looking in, I would say, oh, wow. Okay. After months of negotiation, the prosecutors offered to drop the death penalty if Becky pled guilty. Before accepting this offer, Becky's attorneys reached out to Tim and made him sign a non-disclosure agreement. Becky wanted Tim to hear the truth before pleading guilty. Tim was informed that Becky had in fact killed Linda. Tim was devastated, but he was even more devastated when the news broke about Becky confiding in her cellmates, conducting a murder-for-hire plot to kill Phil and his new wife. Her fellow inmates were reportedly due to be released from prison soon. And for payment, she told them that there was gold and silver in Smith's home that was theirs if they agreed to do the job. Instead, they had brought the authorities proof in the form of a fake note that Becky had written to give them to plant on the scene after Phil had been murdered. O'Donnell tried to get several of her fellow inmates to murder Linda Collins' ex-husband, Phil Smith. That never panned out because those inmates went to investigators. And as they talked, investigators learned that O'Donnell admitted to a appearing on camera, bloody knife in hand. But she claimed that knife was for a chicken, and that investigators doctored the video. Becky ended up accepting the plea deal, confessing to the murder-for-hire plot, as well as the intentional murder of Linda Collins. Ma'am, do you have anything to say to the family? Fifty years in prison, that's the sentence for Rebecca O'Donnell. Here she is, silent, as she leaves the Randolph County Courthouse where it was handed down. O'Donnell pleaded guilty to killing former state senator Linda Collins, who was found dead outside her Pocahontas home last summer. She admitted that she uh, intentionally killed Linda Collins Smith. She also stated that she concealed her body after she killed her. Defense attorney Lee Short says his client appeared solemn in the courtroom. She was sentenced to 40 years for first degree murder and three years for abuse of a corpse. She also pleaded no contest to two murder solicitation charges in Jackson County, facing a seven year sentence for each. Those seven years ran concurrent to each other, but consecutive to the 43. So we've got a total of 50 years that she pled to today. Rebecca O'Donnell, a.k.a. Becky, was convicted in August of 2020 and was sentenced to 50 years behind bars. That what happened to my mother was an awful deed. It was carried out of hate, jealousy, and greed. I believe that Rebecca O'Donnell was stealing money from my mother, and when my mother confronted her about it, she snapped and snapped my mother to death in a fit of rage and perceived self perseverance Today our family has found swift justice by way of a plea deal. No amount of punishment will ever fill that void that Rebecca O'Donnell made in our lives the day she killed our mother. Today we find some shred of peace that Rebecca O'Donnell will be put away in prison for a very long time, unable to hurt anyone else.